what should we sing? Which one is number one on the hip parade? <laughs> Hare Krishna, okay. <laughs> Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Gopi Janava Lava Giri Var Dahuri Haya Gopi Gopi Janava Lava Giri Var Dahuri Haya Giri Sodanandana Braja Janaranjanaya Giri Sodanandana Braja Janaranjanaya Jimmuna Tira Hevana Chahi <laughs> Radamadavan. Here is Giri Mm-hmm. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Rio. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Nithai Gaur Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, the tiger. Hey, the tiger. Hey, Hari 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 Nithai Gaur Hari 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 और फिर मनंदी हरि हरि बोलो सिर प्रभु पान की जाए so we're now gonna continue with our series of verses from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, the most confidential nine knowledge. This is text number 16. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Aham kratu aham yagna Swadaham aham ausadam Mantraham aham evajam Aham agnir aham hutam Aham kratu aham yagna Swadaham hum Asudam Matroham Aham Evagyam Aham Magnir Aham Hutam Aham Kratur Aham Yagna Swaga Swadaham Aham Asadam Mantroham Aham Evagyam Aham Magnir Aham Hutam
Anyone else? <laughs> Aham. I. Gratu. Vedic ritual. Aham. I. Yagna. Smriti sacrifice. Swada. Oblation. Aham. I. Aham. I. Al Saddam. Healing herb, mantra, transcendental chant, aham, I, aham, I, eva, certainly, agyam, melted butter, aham, I, agni, fire, aham, I, hutam, offering. But it is I who am the ritual, I, the sacrifice, the offering of the ancestors, the healing herb, the transcendental chant. I am the butter and the fire and the offering. Purported by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai. The Vedic sacrifice known as Jyoti, Jyotishtoma, Jyotish, Jyotishtoma is also Krishna. He is also the Mahayagna mentioned in the Smriti. The oblations offered to the Pitaloka or the sacrifice performed to please the Pitaloka, considered as a kind of drug in the form of clarified butter, is also Krishna. The mantras chanted in his connection are also Krishna. And many other commodities made with milk products for offering in the sacrifice are also Krishna. The fire is also Krishna because fire is one of the five elements, material elements, and therefore claimed as the separated energy of Krishna. In other words, the Vedic sacrifices recommended in the karma kanda division of the Vedas are in total also Krishna. Or in other words, those who are engaged in rendering devotional service unto Krishna are to be understood to have performed all the sacrifices recommended in the Vedas. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The last line is completely different from the rest. Did you notice that? How everything is pointing towards Krishna and then Prabhupada ends it just to give us a clear understanding of what he, Krishna is really trying to say in this verse. So if Krishna is trying to say something, let's see if we can figure out what he's trying to say. Om Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Sutarine Panchakalpa, Tarubhishya, Kripa, Sindhu, Pyevacha, Patitanam, Bhavane, Bhyo, Vaishnave, Bhyo, Namaho, Namaha, Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadhar, Sivasari, Gaur, Bhaktivrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So why so much emphasis on pointing everything out as being Krishna when Krishna says in so many places? And, uh, 
everything is me anyway. He said, there's only two things. There's my me and my energy. He says, before the creation, only I exist. During the manifestation, it is I who exists. And during the annihilation, it is I who remains. He says that in the Bhagavatam. So Krishna in many places, and we hear from the Acharyas, that everything is Krishna anyway. So why is it such, why such emphasis by Krishna on the very details of, of uh, Jyoti Soma, or let me say, a uh, yagya here, a Karmakanda type yagya? Why does he have to say that again in detail within the, when he says it so many times in a general sense? And we know that that Krishna is the source of everything, and everything is his energy. So the energy and the energy energetic is also, in one sense, identical. And Krishna makes that point that the everything in existence is coming from me, and everything in existence is actually me. So he says it in so many places throughout the scriptures and then through the various pastimes he performs. So why here does he have to say? The ritual, the sacrifice, the offering, the butter, the healing herb, the chant, the fire, the offering. Why does he have to say it in such detail? Anybody? Gadahar? So we are? That's one good point, yeah. That could be taken as an, a principle, but there's other reasons. That, that is true, so that every part of, yeah, I think you hit the pretty much the essence, you know, that, that we're reminded every, at, at every step, that's the point, that everything is him, yeah. Yeah, that's the main point. That people perform all these karmakanda sections in order to get some material benefits. But ultimately, all the ingredients, and then the last word he says, and the offering, that's me also. And then after Prabhupada very carefully repeats what Prabhupada Krishna says, in the, uh, in the translation, Prabhupada says, and it's understood that all sacrifices are performed recommended in devotional service and those who engage in the Krishna consciousness have understood everything is for Krishna anyway. <laughs> so there's a class of people who don't know who make a separation between uh, what the Vedas say in terms of uh, material benefits and the spiritual parts of the Vedas which are more direct in terms of devotional service. So Krishna is pointing it out in this point. Just like in the 15th chapter, what he says, I am the I am the fire of digestion. I am the sun. I am the moon. I am... He says so many things in the, te in the, uh, in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Right? What does he say? What are some of the things he says? Uh, well, among the what? Among the aquatics, I am the shark. Yeah. Yeah. So he's also saying, not only am I everything, but if you want to understand me as the best in all categories, also, I'm also the best in all categories. So you can see me there also. So the whole principle of bhakti is to see Krishna everything and everywhere, and see Krishna in everything. This is the conclusion of Vedic understanding. Um, the tendency of the conditioned soul is to separate. And even we see people who practice spirituality say God is in heaven or he's in the spiritual world, but you know this world is going on because of us. You know, We're down here and he's up there, and once in a while he throws a few things down to us to keep us going. But basically he doesn't have much to do with what's going on down here. Although he checks us out every once in a while, if he makes some prayers, he helps. So you know, so people make a make a division between God and God's energies, and and sometimes the division is so 
strong that they take God out of everything and put him in a church and say that God is only in the church or in the temple or in the mosque. And that's where you can find him. And he's in one category only when you pray. It's not about whatever else you do in life. That's, that's separate. So people have so many misconceptions about life. And therefore, in that misconceptions, they separate God. And therefore, it makes it easier for them to go on with their uh, activities of material, uh, what we say, uh, attainments, trying to become better in material life. So there's a class of people who are not um, into bhakti yoga, but they're into, into the Vedas. And there's a section of the Vedas called the Karmakanda section, which is the ritualistic sections of the Vedas. <laughs> and therefore, but performing different kinds of sacrifices. And here, some of the ingredients of the sacrifice is mentioned. But Krishna wants to say, you know, even though your gain is material, ultimately everything is f coming from me, provided by me, meant for me, and the result is you can attain me. So even those who perform karmakandas rituals, if they dedicate the results of the activity as an offering to Krishna, they get the benefit. Otherwise, there's, their benefit is more like some kind of material elevation, either going to pu pushing their, their credits towards, them, towards the higher planets, or otherwise just um, trying to better their position in their present material life like that. And that goes on pretty much like that. So Krishna wants to make that point and of course he does that for the next few verses just to emphasize that point. But even you know even great spiritualists can't see don't understand this principle. They still make a separation. But we make a separation for the sake of for for the sake of service, there is an, there is a philosophy called pantheism. You've heard of that, pantheism. Pantheism means everything is God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything is God, but in the absolute sense, not that there is the supreme personality and His energy, but everything is God. In other words, the door is God, the the wood is God, the dog is God, you are God. And in other words. That everything is ultimately uh, God, <laughs> and that's pantheism. But then Prabhupada also gives some credit to that, that they're really emphasizing the oneness of the absolute truth. But Vaishnavas know and can understand there is a division for the sake of seva, because without that division, there's no service. If everything is God, then who serves who? God is serving God, right? <laughs> But then again, there is the energy of God, which is also God, provided by God, which is coming from God, is, is the source. And therefore, it is meant to be used in the service of God. That's why God provides this material world with the ingredients, so we can use these ingredients to serve him. Like that. And that, that service connects this the object with the source of the object, and that becomes bhakti. And that's the way out of this material energy or back to the spiritual consciousness like that. But here, it's interesting, Prabhupada's last sentence is that anyone who engages in de devotional service doesn't have to perform any of these rituals. <laughs> because the devotional service is so complete. Devarsi putatma nir nam priting nam na kinka raya riji jam Sarvatma yam sharanam smaram yam kato kato makunda vritti vritti kartam. This is verses from the 11th canto in Srimad Bhagavatam, which describes that when you come into this material world, you have a debt. No matter who you are, at the time of you're born, you somebody's handing you a bill, <laughs> pay the bill. <laughs> and uh, what is the bill? Well, because your mother and father brought you in, you have a debt to them. You're coming in and you're getting sunshine, you're getting moonshine, you're getting water, you're getting air. So you have a debt to the demigods who are supplying these things. 
Now you're coming and you're getting knowledge. That knowledge is coming from great persons in the past. So you have a debt to the sages and people who provide that knowledge. Um, your forefathers are also part of the tradition you fall into. So they also, you can become indebted to them. And then people in general who do different things for you, who have provided your existence, therefore the doctor, so many people who made your appearance happen, you're indebted to them. So when we take birth in this material world, we have so many debts. That's why people who don't take up devotional service are always suffering because rather than paying the debts, they're just taking more from the same sources that give them. But therefore, Prabhupada, in one purport, says people are, are actually thieves. They come in and they simply take, 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 not acknowledging what these gifts are and who they're coming from. Prabhupada uses a very simple example. If you don't pay your water bill, if you don't pay your electrical bill, then they shut it off after some time. <laughs> so in the same way, the heat, the sun is giving heat, so we have a debt to the sun. And the, uh, the air is being provided like that for the demigod Vayu. So, so many debts, but if you take up devotional service, then... Um, there's no more debts <laughs> because one who serves the source of everything, all the all the other debts are automatically taken care of. And so this is a good method for preaching to the non-devotees that uh, when you serve the person who creates everything, who provides everything, um, just like if you please um, the proprietor of the establishment you work for then you have uh, successfully been, been noted as a, the best of all workers. And therefore everything you do is, is, is accepted. So in the same way devotees please the Supreme Lord by engaging the activities of devotional service as an offering to Him, and then they become free from all obligations in this material world. Because those who don't, that when they die, they die with that debt, and then therefore they're guaranteed to have to come back again in the next life to continue with that debt until they actually pay it off. <laughs> so life after life, Michi Maya Lavese, Kacho Habu Bubu Bajiv Krishna Das, E Vishwash, Koledara Tukanai. Yeah, life after life people come and, and they just, just build up more and more debts like that. So, therefore, devotional service wipes away the whole slate like that, and then everybody is situated. Then you're situated nicely. Why? Because you have performed all the sacrifices recommended in the Vedas. So, this is the direct process. You know, just like Prabhupada would say, if you have a million dollars, you have a thousand dollars, you have a hundred dollars. You have all, everything up to a million so when you have, uh, when you serve Krishna, then you, there's no need to serve anyone else. Sometimes people think, well, I still have debts to my family, I still have debts to my boss, so many other things. But if you're engaged in devotional service, automatically you're relieved of those debts like that. Uh, because, you know, Krishna is the source of everything. So this, this last line sort of sums up everything before that by saying, you know, karma khand is nice, but I am that, and the results ultimately are for me anyway. So why waste time with all that? Just engage in devotional service. To make these costly and Vedic sacrifices takes a lot of time, energy, ingredients, resources, and efforts, and the benefits you get are very small. But if one engages just one, if one chants the name of Krishna once, purely, purely, then that's enough to wipe away all of one's sinful reactions committed for thousands of lifetimes. Once chanting purely. That means, pure chanting means uh, chanting with no motivation at all, free from all motivation even the desire to gain spiritual advancement by chanting. That's a motivation. <laughs> so one, once one, just that shows how the power of devotional service, 
it's direct. But many of the other persons who perform various types of spiritual processes recommended in the Vedas can't understand devotional service. That's why it says in the sixth canto, persons like Jamini, Yagyavoki, Yagyavoka, and others, they don't know the purpose of the Vedas. They're attached to the rituals, they're attached to all these performances of all these fancy yogyas that are mentioned in the Vedas. They can't see the benefit of chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> and that's due to the grace of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who, who's kind of taken all of the principles of Vedic knowledge and summed it up in one, one way, that simply by uh, glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his form as Sri Krishna and Vrindavan, then the, that's the absolute principle of, of devotional life. In other words, there's nothing higher than that. And that was, it's complete. And there's nothing better more you can do than that, is to glorify the Lord and to serve the Lord by glorifying the Lord. <laughs> so why waste time with all this, these other things, these rituals, these offerings, these so many things? Of course, now here, we do, sometimes we do yagyas to Nisringadev, like that, and we do Sometimes we do other forms of worship. Sometimes we do uh, these yagyas for marriages. We do yagyas for initiations. But that's just to purify the, the participants so they can actually uh, come to the platform of uh, worshiping the Lord in pure devotion. These yagyas are meant to remove obstacles. Mm -hmm. They're meant to remove obstacles. They're meant to purify the consciousness, to present you, to give you to the stage where you can perform devotional service. Ayabilasita sunya jnana kamaranabhitam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttamam. When you come to the stage of worshiping the Lord with the understanding of what devotional is, service is, to serve the Lord in the mood to please the Lord. That's it. So that's the highest principle. So sometimes we're not always conscious of that. We, we do our service, but we're not always conscious that this is an offering to the Lord, and, or we're not even conscious that, that we're trying to please the Lord by doing this. But if you remain fixed in your devotional service and follow the principles very carefully, then everything you do, is, is accepted as devotional service. And when you uh, chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you're setting, you're bringing your consciousness into that mood. That sets the st pattern for everything we do throughout the day. That's why the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the foundation for all success in all activities of spiritual life. Because it purifies the consciousness and allows one, although we may not always be conscious that we're doing it for Krishna, still, if we're fixed in the chanting of the holy names of the Lord, that carries our consciousness in, through all the activities of devotional service. But still, even higher than that, if we can remember Krishna in everything we do, even while we're performing, because um, <clears throat> just like there was a discussion between Vasudeva and Narada Muni, Vasudev Prabhupada, um, Krishna's father, where Vasudev is talking to Narada Muni that, you know, uh, uh, Krishna's my son, but I'm, I'm not seeing him. I understand he's the Supreme Lord, but I just simply saw him as my son. <laughs> So I'm not, so in that way, Narada Muni was saying, but because you were serving him so nicely and doing everything necessary in the role of a father to provide for the son, your devotion is pure. And he was lamenting that I wasn't remembering the Supreme Lord while I was ser serving the Supreme Lord. <laughs> but Narada Muni clarified that actually. So in, in a practical sense, if you're absorbed in your devotional service, that is perfect. In other words, if you're trying to do your service in the best possible way with the desire to offer it as a, a service to the Lord, that's perfection. Even if you don't remember the Lord, if you can remember the Lord during the activity, 
that makes the activity even more spiritually powerful. But still, it's acceptable on that level of just doing it nicely and offering it uh, as an offering to the Lord. So quality is one of the characteristics of bhakti. Although devotional service is not based on quality, quality is a is a feature of the of the living entity's desire to worship the Lord properly. In other words, whatever you do, try to do it in the best possible way. And in that way, you're showing your devotion through the the idea of wanting to do it in a, in a nice way, in the best possible way. So Prabhupada would emphasize that, try to do everything nicely, and that's an indication of bhakti. Uh, nicely means requires attention, that means attention requires absorption. So when we're absorbed in whatever we're doing, then the quality will eventually start to manifest automatically. But if our minds are not absorbed in what we're doing, or if we're thinking about what we have to do later, sometimes we do that when we chant our rounds. We're chanting our rounds and then we're also thinking about our services throughout the day or what we did yesterday. That is not so bad, but it's not, it's not the idea. The idea is to keep your mind focused on whatever you're doing in, the, in a complete way. And then you're absorbed. Then that, that is actually the perfection of the activity. Then, as it says, everything you do becomes an offering in bhakti, like that. Every part of the activity itself. So you say you're cooking in the kitchen, so you're absorbed in making it nice. So you're getting of the spices, you're thinking how to cook it, you're chopping up the boga, you're actually preparing the, uh, the pots and pans. This is all bhakti because all of it's meant to prepare the offering and nicely and then offer it to Krishna. It's all bhakti. Like that. Okay, so this is how Krishna is actually everything for a devotee. <laughs> yeah, devotees don't see Krishna separate from everything. And they also understand that whatever they can do is by the mercy of Krishna. It's, it's the most amazing when you actually see, when you see devotional service, you realize it's not about you at all. Because <laughs> everything is coming from Krishna, everything is provided by Krishna, the ability to do it is coming from Krishna, the results are meant from Krishna, and your existence is produced by Krishna. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Everything is outside of you, <laughs> in the real sense. But still, you get the credit. <laughs> the spiritual credit, like that. Okay, so we can see if there's any comments or questions. Any uh, Anything about the verse that stands out in your mind? <laughs> Do we have the microphone? Yes. I remember some story connected uh, with this uh, shloka from Bhagavatam. It's from 10th Kento when Krishna and Balara were begging for a food from these sacrificial brahmanas. And then um, they said they, they don't have time. And then the wives of sacrificial brahmanas, they give them the boga or the food. Mm -hmm. They didn't recognize that they are... Uh, actually doing this sacrifice for Krishna mm -hmm. and then Krishna actually came in person but they were just performing <laughs> sacrifices. Yeah, that's pretty much indicative of the ritualistic m mentality. That they're more concerned about the rituals, you know, just like if say you go on the altar and you're asked to do arti, arti so you say, let me see, okay, one, two, Three, four, okay. Now two up, one, two, three up on the head, one, two, three, and then seven down. Okay, I got it now. Okay, that's it. Now the next one is, um, okay, now I got to do it and I got to do it again now. Now what's the other numbers? Again, okay. Okay, it's seven to the feet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Got it. Okay. <laughs> 
And let's see if I can make sure I finish on time. <laughs> so, uh, is there something wrong with that? <laughs> Your focus is on the ritual and not on the object that you're serving. <laughs> you should know the principles as, as, as the offering, and then you focus on offering your devotion in the form of offering these articles accordingly to the object, which is the Lord. <laughs> yeah. So one might think, well, I went on time, I got all the circles right, I know the mantras, I finished on time, <laughs> best arti I've ever did. <laughs> Can't wait till my next chance. Maybe I'll even, you know, I'll even, I'll even count easier than I did the first time. So yeah, so there's the ritualistic mood that, so those Brahmins, yeah, they regretted later because they saw what the benefit their wives got. Although their wives had not, didn't even have a small part of the same Vedic knowledge as they did, they understood the conclusion of the virgins is to please Krishna. <laughs> And so they were cursing themselves and then glorifying their wives. Later, that's when they found when they realized, you know, what they had missed the opportunity like that. So that goes on, as just like you go, just like in this country, you don't see too much of it because there's no, not much of an Indian congregation. But I've been to a lot of Hindu temples in different places around the world. And you'll see that. You'll go into a Hindu temple and you'll see seven or eight altars. And there's Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman, Radha and Krishna. There's Ganesh. There is uh, Shiva. In other words, there's a whole gamut of devas along with Radha and Krishna there. And so they do... Uh, but, you know, when they offer, what do they offer? Some peanuts and some uh, sugarized candy to the de deities. And then they distribute it to the public and they collect donations based on that. <laughs> so their whole idea is, is to somehow support the temple like that. So when they go home, they have kachuris and samosas. But when they, the deities get, you know, peanuts and uh, sugarized candy... <laughs> And so it's like common like that. You'll see that, and like that. And they have all these hired Brahmins. They come in, they're paid. They do the work, and they get their salary, and then they go home. So it's a job. So sometimes we'll go to a Hindu temple and do a kirtan, and everybody will get excited because they don't know. All of a sudden, the atmosphere changes. <laughs> Before it's all rituals and some kind of pujas, you know, like that. They're good at the mantras, like they know the mantras coming from the Vedas for, for worship, but that's all. The deity is an object you know, for activity. They have some, some punya, some pious activities, but they don't understand the purpose of worship. So that's that's quite common in countries like you know that that are not India, but people who are very just like the large Indian congregations in places like the UK, which is very large, or in the United States like that, Canada, very large Indian congregation. And there's Hindu temples all over. Mm -hmm. I used to many times they would invite me to give a lecture. I would go and speak something. And the people who came were pretty good, but the people who run the temple, they were, I mean, they were always friendly, but you could see it was, uh, it wasn't about, it was just giving a little variety to their worship by inviting somebody in. <laughs> You're lucky, you don't have the problems that come from the Indian congregation and you don't have the benefits that come from the Indian <laughs> there's both 
There's problems and there's benefits too. <laughs> but, so yeah. Anyway, I don't want to say anything I shouldn't say. <laughs> Anything else about this verse? It's pretty interesting when you break it down because the last sentence sums up everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is about Krishna. Let's see this. This is the first verse in a series of verses of the same topic. Okay, and it goes on all the way up to Yeah. And 19, yeah, and 20 changes. But 20 also kind of hints on the same principle. Mm -hmm. Before, when you teach what it is, you have to speak a lot about what is it, what it isn't. This is very important. Devotees should know this when they're preaching that, you know, it's not always about telling what it is. It's mostly mostly telling about what it isn't. Because <laughs> people are so much in the wrong conceptions. And so you have to destroy that. And you'll see a lot of Srila Prabhupada's preaching was to cut through the ignorance of what is spiritual life and what is not spiritual life, what is material life, what is the wrong conception of material. In other words, it's just like this, like the the Back to Godhead magazine has, uh, this is, uh, uh, Godhead is light, uh, Nessence is darkness. That's the motto on the top of the page. So one has to speak about Nessence and God side by side to enlighten people. Because people may understand what you say about what is, but if they're not given the knowledge about what is not, they continue in the wrong way. And therefore that kind of minimizes the effects that they get from doing the right thing. In fact, a lot of times it nullifies it. Just like if you're doing devotional service and you're doing it offensively, you're going to get very little benefit from it, and sometimes practically no benefit from it. Just like there's one verse, one can chant the holy names of the Lord for millions of lifetimes, but if they're chanted offensively, they will never get the benefit of the holy name, love of God. <coughs> so emphasizing what is not is a very important part of uh, enlightening people in the truth like that. So all classes, I'll give you a hint, of course this is not generally, this is generally, you always start your class if you're speaking by what is not and then you end what is. You always end on the sweet note. <laughs> you don't end on <laughs> what is not because that's the last thing people remember. <laughs> So if you're speaking, you always explain, you know, the wrong things or the misconceptions, the things that are outside, and then you gradually move towards the truth, like that. You gradually move towards the truth, and then you end with the absolute truth. And here, in this verse, the, the understanding is ultimately, there's no need to do anything else but devotional service. <laughs> That's the conclusion of this verse. <laughs> One who's doing that is doing everything. <laughs> One who's doing that is satisfying all living entities and every, everywhere within the universe. And the simple understanding is based on one verse from the Bhagavatam that when you water the root of the tree, <laughs> the branches, the leaves, the twigs, the flowers, everything connected to the root gets the benefit of the watering process. And the verse goes on to say, when you put food in the stomach, then the rest of the body gets nourished. So one who is serving Krishna, the absolute truth, then everyone everywhere benefits. 
Sometimes, sometimes we think how to benefit others. You are simply by engaging in devotional service. Your mother, your friends, your father, everyone re connected to you is getting benefit. And people in general are getting benefit simply by the presence of the devotees. Even if they are not connected in any way still, the presence of devotional service purifies the atmosphere, purifies the, the area, everything. Hmm. Okay, so I guess we'll stop here. We're right at 8 o'clock. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Thank you for choosing this verse, Alex. Thank you. <laughs>